morning, our scripture reading is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, found on page 1190 in your pew Bibles. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have, have been cleansed once for all. It would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of goats, bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with, with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. This is the word of our Lord. This morning, we're going to start a journey together. Over the next several weeks, we are going to be embarking on a sermon series called Man's Problems, God's Answers, where we'll examine some of the basic human issues that every person faces in their lives and how God has provided an answer for those problems. We begin this journey this morning by looking at the problem of guilt. Have you ever felt guilty about something? If so, what was it? Was it for something small? Perhaps it was for something that was not so small. Further, we might ask the question, well, what causes the feeling of guilt? Why do we feel guilt in our lives? Why do we have its presence with us? Perhaps you've never given this subject much thought, but nonetheless, it affects every person of every age, of every generation. Everybody feels guilty. So let's try to answer this first question. What causes the feeling of guilt? Well, generally speaking, guilt is a natural feeling that is produced as a result of something that we know to be wrong, when we do something that we know to be wrong. According to psychology today, people may, people may feel guilt for a variety of reasons, including an act that they have committed or think that they have committed, a failure to do something that they should have done, or thoughts that they think are morally wrong. That definition is fine, but it doesn't explain why we feel guilt for doing something or not doing something, as the case may be. What creates within us that feeling that something is amiss, something's not right? And that is where secular science must be put aside as we look to the deeper theological answer. I think the definition that is given by author Dwight Pentecost certainly defines the heart of the matter when he says this, guilt is the individual's response to his consciousness of having violated God's holiness. In other words, each and every human being is born with some internal mechanism that allows them to understand when a certain boundary has been crossed. And when that boundary is crossed, whether in action or in failure of action, that natural response is to feel it, to feel that violation in the form of guilt. It lets us know internally that something has gone wrong. Something has happened and has created in us an overwhelming sense of heaviness and shame and, and even sadness. And until it is remedied, we cannot feel whole and complete again. 
that amiss, that disturbance will remain. Now, we can certainly feel guilt when we do something wrong to other people, and we do. But ultimately, all feelings of guilt can be traced back to violating the law of God in some way, some manner, some fashion. That is why guilt is ultimately a theological matter. And unless a person has something wrong with their minds, every person will feel the pangs of guilt because everyone has done things that cause guilt. In good Bible language, the reason for this is because all have sinned and have fallen well short of the glory of God. And if you were paying attention, by quoting that verse, I made the very real and intimate connection that exists between sin and guilt. And the reason I made that connection is because that is exactly what Scripture does. It connects those two things. Guilt is the direct result of sin, of violating God's laws. It let's us know that a violation has occurred that needs to be dealt with. It's the very part of the human being that is created in the image of God that, that speaks to us in that way. Because we are created in the image and the likeness of God. Animals in the created world, they don't, they don't experience guilt. A lion doesn't feel bad about killing a leopard. They don't have that. That's a human trait. And until that wrong has been righted, that violation of God, that feeling of guilt is going to be with us. And that is what this section of the book of Hebrews is dealing with, actually. This text is giving us the answer, believe it or not, to the problem of guilt. And I hope that as we unpack the truth, uh, the truth of this passage, that you'll be able to better understand the power of what God has done for us in Jesus. And then if you have been plagued with guilt or are being plagued with guilt right now, that you might find some release from that bondage and embrace the healing that only God can provide, because only God can provide that. The first thing we can learn from this text is something that I already uh, alluded to, and that the presence of guilt is, is the evidence of violating the law of God. The book of Hebrews is in large part demonstrating for us how Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and that the whole of the old covenant system is now replaced because of what he has done for us. And of course, that whole old covenant system was rooted in the constant need for sacrifices that needed to be made in order to cover the sins of the people, cover over them. There were many forms of sacrifices and offerings that were made all throughout the, the Jewish year. But they all shared one common feature. They all needed to be done so that the people could draw near to God. Couldn't happen while sin remained. Sin needed to be dealt with before they could come near to their holy and righteous God and his act of worship. And the biggest sacrifice for the ancient Israelites was made during the Feast of Atonement where countless offerings of bulls and goats and even birds were made on behalf of the people's sins. Of course, this whole process would need to be repeated next year, and the year after that, and the year after that, and the year after that, and on and on and on it would go. In fact, the author of Hebrews said earlier in the book, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And that's a powerful statement. What that statement does is to remind us that the wages of sin, if you could call them wages, is death. Always Always, always. The wages of sin is always death. And that the forgiveness of sin can only be accomplished through the shedding of blood, the sacrificial death. In the case of the Old Covenant, a form of, a form of forgiveness came through the sacrifice of animals. And what the author of Hebrews does is he tells us that that Old Covenant system was not what God actually wanted. It's not what he desired. It was instituted in order to provide the people with what we might call a temporary covering for sin, but God wanted something more for his people, something longer lasting and permanent. And so we read, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. And there it is. So what we can see is that although God provided the means for the Old Testament people to draw near and worship, it was only a temporary provision. It tells us that even in the time of the Old Covenant, God had already planned for something else, something greater. 
And these early, yearly offerings and sacrifices could never, ever make the people perfect. They could never do what God desired in them. As he says in verse 2, otherwise would they not have stopped being offered? And the answer is yes, of course they would. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. Ah, did you catch the key word? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. So we can see the connection that exists between sin and guilt. We might say that the animal sacrifices at best provided some temporary relief from the sense of guilt so that the people might feel less uncomfortable as they draw, uh, drew near to worship uh, in, to God. But that feeling that they got, that temporary relief would be short-lived. The problem, of course, is that the people sin. They sin whether in thought, whether in word, whether in deed, just like we do. And if the connection between sin and guilt is, is as close as we are suggesting, we can perfectly understand of verse 3, but those sacrifices are actually an annual reminder of sins. Every year the people needed to offer the same sacrifices because every year the people were trying to deal with their sin and the guilt that it produced. It was a never-ending battle. This was something that needed to be done if the people wanted to draw near to their God. It had to be done. But then we are introduced to an inherent problem with this old covenant sacrificial system. The author says in verse 4, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Can't be done. So the question is, well, wait a minute. I thought God provided this sacrificial system so that the people could draw near to him. So they had some way of, of coming close in this holy act of worship and dealing with sin and guilt. And here's the answer. Yep, God did provide that. But the blood of bulls and goats could only cover, or perhaps we could say hide, sin. I've often thought about it like this, right or wrong, I guess I don't know. Uh, as the sinful people come close to God, they put on kind of this temporary outer cover that hides what is underneath that coat. But no sooner did they put that thing on, that covering on, that they take it off again, revealing that stain of sin that penetrates them all the way through. Bulls and goats could cover sin, but they could never take it away. Quite honestly, if we think about it, the old covenant system was rather depressing and even hopeless. If the people's sins can't be dealt with in a more permanent and purifying way, then the possibility of true restoration and healing and intimacy with God was all, would always be impossible. And the sense of guilt would simply be a way of life for people who could never really find forgiveness. But the purpose of Hebrews is to reveal the importance of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here the author does something rather unexpected. He gives us a glimpse into a conversation that took place between God the Father and Jesus the Son just before he took on human flesh and made his dwelling among us. This was a conversation that was first prophesied in Psalm 40. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. So we can see just how God felt about that old covenant system. This was not what he desired for his people. God isn't interested in dead bulls and goats. He's not looking to have a barbecue. What God desired for his people was for them to be able to draw near to him in fellowship and in intimacy and in, in worship. But human sin would make that kind of intimacy impossible. As long as the people were guilty of sin, they would remain distant from God and that sense of guilt would be forever with them. The sacrificial system provided a very temporary and limited relief, but it could never give the people what they needed for lasting restoration and lasting healing. Each year would be just like the one before it, and so that, that continuous cycle of sin would just go on and on and on and on. And so we can say the presence of guilt is the evidence of violating the law of God. But the author has already given us a little bit of a glimpse of hope, which we can now explore just a little bit further and say that the perfect sacrifice of Christ is God's answer for that which plagues the human consciousness. 
The author of Hebrews is now going to give us uh, some further insights into the divine conversations that were revealed in various Old Testament scriptures. And here the author first brings us back to Psalm 40. He says, Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Now Psalm 40 was written by King David in response to the many things that were happening in his life. Some of them were very serious. And yet David's words also become the words of Jesus, which speak prophetically about his mission of salvation to us. He further quotes from Psalm 40 when he says, First, he says this, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. What this is telling us is that the Old Testament sacrificial system fits perfectly with the Old Covenant law. There's no problem there whatsoever. But again, this was not something that was actually pleasing to God. It didn't make him happy. What use were dead animals to the creator of heaven and earth? None. This old system was for the benefit of the people only. That they might have some means by which they could approach God who was holy and who was other. But if that system was the best that they could hope for, then it was entirely inadequate. It was a faulty system. God knew this which is why burnt offerings and sin offerings were not pleasing to him. And by quoting Psalm 40, the author is leading us on a path that is meant to bring us really to a a profound truth. He continues with this quotation. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. The first part of this verse is the quotation directly from Psalm 40. And the second part of this verse is the author's explanation of it. We've heard about the body that has been prepared. We've heard about the the fact that bulls and goats are not something that God takes pleasure in. Now we've heard about the fact that a person has come to do the will of God. So what is this will of God? Well, the author tells us. He says he sets aside the first to establish the second. And what this is referring to is that old covenant sacrificial system. We already know that it is inadequate. We already know how God feels about it. We already know that it offers no lasting help to those who are locked in the bonds and the chains of sin and guilt. So what is it that the author is leading us to? Verse 10 gives us the answer. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What this is telling us is that in Christ, God has replaced the old with the new. He's replaced that ineffectual sacrificial system for one that accomplishes his will or his desire. That old system of bringing bulls and goats to cover the sin has now been set aside and replaced with something more powerful, more lasting, more permanent, more all-encompassing. And of course, that sacrificial replacement was the Lord Jesus Christ himself, his body. It was by the taking on of human flesh and living a life of obedience and sinlessness, that he was able to provide what no animal sacrifice ever could, lasting removal of sin and guilt on account of sin. And that's important. This was no temporary covering. This was a permanent state of being. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So what does that mean? What is the author of Hebrews trying to say? He's saying that you and I, through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, are no longer viewed by God as unworthy sinners, tainted through and through by the stain of sin. In Jesus, we have been giving something that was not in our power to ever give to ourselves. Nothing in this world could ever give that to us. The sacrifice of Christ was made once for all. There's no longer need for yearly sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. That system has been abandoned. We have been atoned for, permanently. No matter how guilty we might have felt or how sinful our past might be, it doesn't matter. The sacrifice of Jesus is of such efficacy that all sin for all time is covered in the atonement that he provides. So we can say it again, once for all. 
And we might ask then, well, if, if guilt is direct, the direct result of sin, then shouldn't guilt be removed when we are forgiven of our sins through Jesus Christ? And here's the answer, yeah. And if a person has truly repented of sin and has trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a cleansing aspect that happens to our soul, to our consciousness, that is no longer burdened by guilt. If we go back to verse 2, we remember that we were told, for the worshipers would, would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. And that's an important statement. But I also need to say something else. Something that is true for many, many people. Although they may seek the forgiveness of God and even receive the forgiveness of God, in many cases, those same people find it impossible to forgive themselves. They can't do it. In those instances, it is not God who is making them feel guilty. It's their own unwillingness to allow themselves to be forgiven. Maybe the people think that I've just done too many bad things. I just can't do it. I met a few people who fit into this category. God might be willing to forgive me, but I cannot forgive myself. For those people, healing and restoration and cleansing will never come because they will not allow themselves to receive it. They remain shut off to it, and that sense of overwhelming guilt will burden them and weigh heavy on them until they finally come to that place that they receive only that what Jesus can give. Are our standards higher than God's? God may forgive me, but I will not forgive myself. Sometimes we have that mindset, don't we? Unfortunately, that sounds like the work of the devil, who seeks to keep us, people of God, in bondage and in suffering. Even when God offers that grace and that forgiveness freely, the devil says, no, you don't want that. You hold on to it. You keep it, because you don't deserve it. But the truth of this text is profound. The perfect sacrifice of Christ is God's answer for that which plagues the human consciousness. We can be forgiven, we can be restored, we can be cleansed, we can be healed. And so we understand this wonderful truth. But how is that truth to be lived out in our own lives of faith? Jesus' finished work allows the people of God the fullness of God's redemption. So we get that the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient for our past sins to be forgiven by God, but but what about when we sin as believers? Anybody here ever sin? I see no hands at all. Good for you. Well, the author is going to help us to answer that question, but first he wants to explain how that old and uh, new system are different. Beginning in verse 11, he says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. The picture here is of perpetual work. That is to say, the work of the one offering sacrifices for the sins of the people is never ending. It will never stop. I've been told that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. Well, if that is true, then this Old Testament sacrificial system is a kind of insanity. It's over and over and over again, always with the same result, never being able to do what it hoped to do. And as far as being a cure for sin, it will not work. These sacrifices can never take away sins, the author says. But nonetheless, day after day, year after year, the sacrifices are made. And now the author tells us about this new system. But when this high priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. There's a particular image here that we are meant to catch. Jesus has made one perfect sacrifice that is uh, sufficient for all people everywhere for all time, and because he has, he has now sat down at the right hand of God in power and in authority. This is said in contrast to that old system, that old covenant system, where there is no sitting, there is no resting for the priests, their work is never done. No matter how many sacrifices they make, it will just continue on and on and on. So what this reinforces for us is the notion of the completeness, the wholeness of the kind of sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. There is no need for additional sacrifices or 
a redo or to supplement what Jesus has already done. His work is total and complete. And now he sits at the right hand of God as our advocate, as our voice. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So as the author has explained a little further how Jesus' sacrifice affects our our lives with God, he also is going to begin to answer our question of how this truth is to be lived out in our lives of daily faith. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now that almost sounds like an error, doesn't it? Did he actually mean to say that? How can a a people be perfect while at the same time be undergoing the process of being made holy? Those two things don't seem to jive very well. Well, the author directs us to yet another Old Testament scripture passage that that, uh, even highlights the uh, involvement of the Holy Spirit in its application. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant that I will make with them at that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart and I will write them on their minds. This quotation comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, where God is speaking through the prophet to a people who are about to be carried off to Babylon in judgment for the 70-year captivity. What is the reason for this judgment? And the answer is disobedience, willful sin, the rejection of the old covenant, the covenant that God had made with their forefathers. And the reason the author of Hebrews brings up this passage from Jeremiah is because the same principle applies to you and me. God has chosen the people of Israel as his own. They were set apart for his purposes. But through willful disobedience and their disregard for living a life that was pleasing to God, The people forsook what God had given to them and they chose a different path. They took a different way and that was displeasing to God. That was a life that led to death. And that same principle is true for all those who embrace the new covenant system. God has chosen us. God has done everything that is needed for us to be able to draw near to him and live in a way that that brings him honor and glory. We have been made perfect, we can say, through Jesus. There's nothing else that needs to be done. It doesn't mean, however, that we are perfect. In fact, the Christian life is one that is constantly growing and maturing and and deepening as we follow, as the Spirit of God leads us and works in our lives. God has done everything needed for us to succeed in the faith, if we can say it that way. And our task as Christians is to persevere in the faith, to not lose heart, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and to live by faith and not by sight no matter what might be happening in this world, to trust God completely and to trust in all that God has done for us in Jesus. We need to live a life that keeps us from turning away from God, from engaging activities that bring us back into that, those same old feelings of violating the laws of God and feeling that overwhelming presence of guilt. I remember watching a television program some years back. It was one of those late night hospital dramas that are so prevalent. And one of the doctors, a female doctor, was having an extramarital affair and was feeling that heavy weight of guilt in her life. She was having trouble functioning at work. She was just overwhelmed by it. And while she was treating one of her, uh, one of her patients, it was revealed to, that her patient too was also having an extramarital affair that had been going on for many, many months, even uh, almost years. And so the doctor was curious. She asked the, asked the patient, don't you feel guilty for doing that? And I remember what the patient said because it struck me. The patient said, I used to feel guilty, but I don't anymore. And I think what that demonstrates is what happens when we refuse to remain living for the Lord Jesus Christ. We destroy the work of grace and we become hard we become callous to the conviction of the Holy Spirit who brings out that notion that something has gone wrong, something needs to be fixed here. That is the importance of being devoted to our faith. Listen to what the author tells us in these last two verses. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. 
Let me rephrase that. Their sins and lawless acts I have wiped clean from my memory. I have erased my hard drive, if we can say it that way. You think that's a powerful statement? Because I think that's a powerful statement. This is what the Christian faith is all about. Forgiveness and healing and restoration. Drawing near to God because of what Jesus has done. That is what it means to live with the peace of God that passes all worldly understanding because we are no longer enemies of God. We can come near to him. And that is the life that God desires for us. Jesus' finished work allows the people of God the fullness of God's redemption. The problem of guilt. It is a common problem. It is a serious problem. But the good news of this text is that God in Jesus has given us the answer for the guilt that results from violating the laws of God. In Jesus, we have been forgiven. In Jesus, our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west, never to touch again. In Jesus, our sins have been wiped clean from God's memory. He doesn't even remember them. Do we understand that? Have we embraced that wonderful news? If you are living with the problem of guilt, God has given you the answer. So let me ask you something this morning. Are you still holding on to the guilt for things that God has wiped from his memory? In order to live a life that is restored and forgiven, we need to embrace what Jesus has given to us and remain true to him in the way we live. There is nothing more that needs to be done, nothing more that needs to be added to what he has already done. All that God desires for us is freely offered to those who will just simply receive it. And when we do, as the author writes earlier in the book of Hebrews, we can come boldly before the throne of grace, knowing that we have been perfected through the Lord Jesus Christ. When was the last time you were feeling like you could come boldly before the throne of grace? But that is what God wants. And that is what he has given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem of guilt is really a problem no more if we will receive what God has given to us. Let us then live in all of the fruits and the blessings and the joys of what we have in Jesus. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the power of your word and what it means to us. And so often, Lord, we were we are reminded that we don't apply those truths to our own lives. Perhaps we acknowledge them with our minds, we understand them intellectually, but when it comes to real life, we keep them at a distance from us. That is a mistake. Help us, Lord, to bring those truths near to our hearts, to penetrate our hearts, to let them sink deep within us, to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us to make us into new creations. Help us to receive what you have given. Forgiveness, restoration, healing, cleansing, and life. And help us to live in that new life with the joy that can only come from being a child of God. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your patience. And we thank you for your love. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.